You're listening to Morning Short, the podcast that brings you one great short story every morning. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and any podcast app you like. Today's story is A Mother by James Joyce. Before we begin the story, I'd like to remind you to visit share.morningshort.com and invite a few friends to Morning Short. If 10 friends sign up using your personal invitation link, we'll send you a free Morning Short t-shirt. So start your sharing at share.morningshort.com. And now to the story. Mr. Hallahan, assistant secretary of the Era Abu Society, had been walking up and down Dublin for nearly a month with his hands and pockets full of dirty pieces of paper, arranging about the series of concerts. He had a game leg, and for this his friends called him Hoppy Hollahan. He walked up and down constantly, stood by the hour at street corners, arguing the point, and made notes. But in the end it was Mrs. Kearney who arranged everything. Miss Devlin had become Mrs. Kearney out of spite. She had been educated in a high-class convent where she had learned French and music. As she was naturally pale and unbending in manner, she made few friends at school. When she came to the age of marriage, she was sent out to many houses where her playing and ivory manners were much admired. She sat amid the chilly circle of her accomplishments, waiting for some suitor to brave it and offer her a brilliant life. But the young men whom she met were ordinary, and she gave them no encouragement, trying to console her romantic desires by eating a great deal of Turkish delight in secret. However, when she drew near the limit and her friends began to loosen their tongues about her, she silenced them by marrying Mr. Kearney, who was a bootmaker on Ormond Quay. He was much older than she. His conversation, which was serious, took place at intervals in his great brown beard. After the first year of married life, Mrs. Kearney perceived that such a man would wear better than a romantic person, but she never put her own romantic ideas away. He was sober, thrifty, and pious. He went to the altar every first Friday, sometimes with her, oftener by himself. But she never weakened in her religion and was a good wife to him. At some party in a strange house, when she lifted her eyebrow ever so slightly, he stood up to take his leave. And, when his cough troubled him, she put the eider-down quilt over his feet and made a strong rum punch. For his part, he was a model father. By paying a small sum every week into a society, he ensured for both his daughters a dowry of one hundred pounds each when they came to the age of twenty-four. He sent the older daughter, Kathleen, to a good convent, where she learned French and music, and afterward paid her fees at the academy. Every year in the month of July, Mrs. Kearney found occasion to say to some friend, My good man is packing us off to Scarry's for a few weeks. If it was not Scarry's, it was Holt or Greystones. When the Irish revival began to be appreciable, Mrs. Kearney determined to take advantage of her daughter's name and brought an Irish teacher to the house. Kathleen and her sister sent Irish picture postcards to their friends, and these friends sent back other picture postcards. On special Sundays, when Mrs. Kearney went with his family to the pro-cathedral, a little crowd of people would assemble after Mass at the corner of Cathedral Street. They were all friends of the Kearneys, musical friends or nationalist friends, and when they had played every little counter of gossip, they shook hands with one another, all together, laughing at the crossing of so many hands, and said goodbye to one another in Irish. Soon the name of Miss Kathleen Kearney began to be heard often on people's lips. People said that she was very clever at music, and a very nice girl, and, moreover, that she was a believer in the language movement. Mrs. Kearney was well content at this. Therefore, she was not surprised when one day Mr. Hollahan came to her and proposed that her daughter should be the accompanist at a series of four grand concerts which his society was going to give in the ancient concert rooms. She brought him into the drawing room, made him sit down, and brought out the decanter and the silver biscuit barrel. She entered heart and soul into the details of the enterprise, advised and dissuaded, 
and finally a contract was drawn up by which Kathleen was to receive eight guineas for her services as accompanist at the four grand concerts. As Mr. Hollihan was a novice in such delicate manners as the wording of bills and the disposing of items in a program, Mrs. Kearney helped him. She had tact. She knew what artistes should go into capitals and what artistes should go into small type. She knew that the first tenor would not like to come on after Mr. Mead's comic turn. To keep the audience continually diverted, she slipped the doubtful items in between the old favorites. Mr. Hollihan called to see her every day to have her advice on some point. She was invariably friendly and advising, homely, in fact. She pushed the decanter towards him, saying, Now help yourself, Mr. Hollihan. And while he was helping himself, she said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of it. Everything went on smoothly. Mrs. Kearney bought some lovely blush pink charmeuse in brown Thomas's to let into the front of Kathleen's dress. It cost a pretty penny, but there are occasions when a little expense is justifiable. She took a dozen of two-shilling tickets for the first concert and sent them to those friends who could not be trusted to come otherwise. She forgot nothing, and, thanks to her, everything that was to be done was done. The concerts were to be on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. When Mrs. Kearney arrived with her daughter at the ancient concert rooms on Wednesday night, she did not like the looks of things. A few young men, wearing bright blue badges in their coats, stood idle in the vestibule. None of them wore evening dress. She passed by with her daughter, and a quick glance through the open door of the hall showed her the cause of the stewards' idleness. At first, she wondered, had she mistaken the hour? No, it was twenty minutes to eight. In the dressing room behind the stage, she was introduced to the secretary of the society, Mr. Fitzpatrick. She smiled and shook his hand. He was a little man with a white, vacant face. She noticed that he wore his soft brown hat carelessly on the side of his head and that his accent was flat. He held a program in his hand, and while he was talking to her, he chewed one end of it into a moist pulp. He seemed to bear disappointments lightly. Mr. Hollihan came into the dressing room every few minutes with reports from the box office. The artistes talked among themselves nervously, glanced from time to time at the mirror, and rolled and unrolled their music. When it was nearly half past eight, the few people in the hall began to express their desire to be entertained. Mr. Fitzpatrick came in, smiled vacantly at the room, and said, Well now, ladies and gentlemen, I suppose we'd better open the ball. Mrs. Kearney rewarded his very flat final syllable with a quick stare of contempt, and then said to her daughter encouragingly, Are you ready, dear? When she had an opportunity, she called Mr. Hollihan aside and asked him to tell her what it meant. Mr. Hollihan did not know what it meant. He said that the committee had made a mistake in arranging for four concerts. Four was too many. And the artistes, said Mrs. Kearney. Of course, they're doing their best, but really, they are not good. Mr. Hollihan admitted that the artistes were no good, but the committee, he said, had decided to let the first three concerts go as they pleased and reserved all the talent for Saturday night. Mrs. Kearney said nothing, but as the mediocre items followed one after another on the platform and the few people in the hall grew fewer and fewer, she began to regret that she had put herself to any expense for such a concert. There was something she didn't like about the look of things, and Mr. Fitzpatrick's vacant smile irritated her very much. However, she said nothing, and waited to see how it would end. The concert expired shortly before ten, and everyone went home quickly. The concert on Thursday night was better attended, but Mrs. Kearney saw at once that the house was filled with paper. The audience behaved indecorously, as if the concert were an informal dress rehearsal. Mr. Fitzpatrick seemed to enjoy himself. He was quite unconscious that Mrs. Kearney was taking angry note of his conduct. He stood at the edge of the screen from time to time, jutting out his head and exchanging a laugh with two friends in the corner of the balcony. In the course of the evening, Mrs. Kearney learned that the Friday concert was to be abandoned and that the committee was going to move heaven and earth to secure a bumper house on Saturday night. When she heard this, she sought out Mr. Hollihan.
She buttonholed him as he was limping out quickly with a glass of lemonade for a young lady and asked him, was it true? Yes, it was true. But, of course, that doesn't alter the contract, she said. The contract was for four concerts. Mr. Hollihan seemed to be in a hurry. He advised her to speak to Mr. Fitzpatrick. Mrs. Kearney was now beginning to be alarmed. She called Mr. Fitzpatrick away from his screen and told him that her daughter had signed for four concerts and that, of course, according to the terms of the contract, she should receive the sum originally stipulated for, whether the society gave the four concerts or not. Mr. Fitzpatrick, who did not catch the point at issue very quickly, seemed unable to resolve the difficulty and said that he would bring the matter before the committee. Mrs. Kearney's anger began to flutter in her cheek, and she had all she could do to keep from asking, and who was the comete, pray? But she knew that it would not be ladylike to do that, so she was silent. Little boys were sent out into the principal streets of Dublin early on Friday morning with bundles of handbills. Special puffs appeared in all the evening papers, reminding the music-loving public of the treat which was in store for it on the following evening. Mrs. Kearney was somewhat reassured, but she thought well to tell her husband part of her suspicions. He listened carefully and said that perhaps it would be better if he went with her on Saturday night. She agreed. She respected her husband in the same way as she respected the general post office, as something large, secure, and fixed, and though she knew the small number of his talents, she appreciated his abstract value as a male. She was glad that he had suggested coming with her. She thought her plans over. The night of the grand concert came. Mrs. Kearney, with her husband and daughter, arrived at the ancient concert rooms three quarters of an hour before the time at which the concert was to begin. By ill luck, it was a rainy evening. Mrs. Kearney placed her daughter's clothes and music in charge of her husband and went all over the building looking for Mr. Hollihan or Mr. Fitzpatrick. She could find neither. She asked the stewards was any member of the committee in the hall, and, after a great deal of trouble, a steward brought out a little woman named Miss Bairn, to whom Mrs. Kearney explained that she wanted to see one of the secretaries. Miss Bairn expected them any minute, and asked could she do anything. Mrs. Kearney looked searchingly at the oldish face, which was screwed into an expression of trustfulness and enthusiasm, and answered, No, thank you. The little woman hoped they would have a good house. She looked out at the rain until the melancholy of the wet street effaced all the trustfulness and enthusiasm from her twisted features. Then she gave a little sigh and said, Ah, oh, well, we did our best, the dear knows. Mrs. Kearney had to go back to the dressing room. The artistes were arriving. The bass and the second tenor had already come. The bass, Mr. Duggan, was a slender young man with a scattered black moustache. He was the son of a hall porter in an office in the city, and as a boy he had sung prolonged bass notes in the resounding hall. From this humble state he had raised himself until he had become a first-rate artiste. He had appeared in grand opera. One night, when an operatic artiste had fallen ill, he had undertaken the part of the king in the opera of Maritana at the Queen's Theatre. He sang his music with great feeling and volume, and was warmly welcomed by the gallery, but... Unfortunately, he marred the good impression by waving his nose in his gloved hand once or twice, out of thoughtlessness. He was unassuming and spoke little. He said use so softly that it passed unnoticed, and he never drank anything stronger than milk for his voice's sake. Mr. Bell, the second tenor, was a fair-haired little man who competed every year for prizes at the Fesh Coil. On his fourth trial, he had been awarded a bronze medal. He was extremely nervous and extremely jealous of other tenors, and he covered his nervous jealousy with an ebullient friendliness. It was his humor to have people know what an ordeal a concert was to him. Therefore, when he saw Mr. Duggan, he went over to him and asked, Are you in it too? Yes, said Mr. Duggan. Mr. Bell laughed at his fellow sufferer, held out his hand and said, Shake! Mrs. Kearney passed by these two young men and went to the edge of the screen to view the house. The seats were being filled up rapidly, and a pleasant noise circulated in the auditorium. She came back and spoke to her husband privately. Their conversation was evidently about Kathleen, for they both glanced at her often as she stood chatting to one of her nationalist friends, Miss Healy, the contralto.
An unknown solitary woman with a pale face walked through the room. The women followed with keen eyes the faded blue dress which was stretched upon a meager body. Someone said that she was Madame Glynn, the soprano. I wonder where they dug her up, said Kathleen to Miss Healy. I'm sure I never heard of her. Miss Healy had to smile. Mr. Hollihan limped into the dressing room at that moment, and the two young ladies asked him who was the unknown woman. Mr. Hollihan said that she was Madame Glynn from London. Madame Glynn took her stand in a corner of the room, holding a roll of music stiffly before her, and from time to time changing the direction of her startled gaze. The shadow took her faded dress into shelter, but fell revengefully into the little cup behind her collarbone. The noise of the hall became more audible. The first tenor and the baritone arrived together. They were both well-dressed, stout, and complacent, and they brought a breath of opulence among the company. Mrs. Kearney brought her daughter over to them and talked to them amiably. She wanted to be on good terms with them, but while she strove to be polite, her eyes followed Mr. Hollihan in his limping and devious courses. As soon as she could, she excused herself and went out after him. Mr. Hollihan, I want to speak to you for a moment. They went down to a discreet part of the corridor. Mrs. Kearney asked him when was her daughter going to be paid. Mr. Hollihan said that Mr. Fitzpatrick had charge of that. Mrs. Kearney said that she didn't know anything about Mr. Fitzpatrick. Her daughter had signed a contract for eight guineas and she would have to be paid. Mr. Hollihan said that it wasn't his business. Why isn't it your business? asked Mrs. Kearney. Didn't you yourself bring her the contract? Anyway, if it's not your business, it's my business, and I mean to see to it. You'd better speak to Mr. Fitzpatrick, said Mr. Hollihan distantly. I don't know anything about Mr. Fitzpatrick, repeated Mrs. Kearney. I have my contract, and I intend to see that it is carried out. When she came back to the dressing room, her cheeks were slightly suffused. The room was lively. Two men in outdoor dress had taken possession of the fireplace and were chatting familiarly with Miss Haley and the baritone. They were the Freeman Man and Mr. O'Madden Burke. The Freeman Man had come in to say that he could not wait for the concert as he had to report the lecture which an American priest was given in the mansion house. He said they were to leave the report for him at the Freeman office and he would see that it went in. He was a gray-haired man with a plausible voice and careful manners. He held an extinguished cigar in his hand, and the aroma of cigar smoke floated near him. He had not intended to stay a moment because concerts and artistes bored him considerably, but he remained leaning against the mantelpiece. Miss Healy stood in front of him, talking and laughing. He was old enough to suspect one reason for her politeness, but young enough in spirit to turn the moment to account. The warmth, fragrance, and color of her body appealed to his senses. He was pleasantly conscious that the bosom which he saw rise and fall slowly beneath him rose and fell at that moment for him, that the laughter and fragrance and willful glances were his tribute. When he could stay no longer, he took leave of her regretfully. O'Madden Burke will write the notice, he explained to Mr. Hollihan, and I'll see it in. Thank you very much, Mr. Hendrick, said Mr. Hollihan. You'll see it in, I know. Now won't you have a little something before you go? I don't mind said Mr. Hendrick. The two men went along some tortuous passages and up a dark staircase and came to a secluded room where one of the stewards was uncorking bottles for a few gentlemen. One of these gentlemen was Mr. O'Madden Burke, who had found out the room by instinct. He was a suave elderly man who balanced his imposing body when at rest upon a large silk umbrella. His magniloquent Western name was the moral umbrella upon which he balanced the fine problem of his finances. He was widely respected. While Mr. Hollihan was entertaining the Freeman man, Mrs. Kearney was speaking so animatedly to her husband that he had to ask her to lower her voice. The conversation of the others in the dressing room had become strained. Mr. Bell, the first item, stood ready with his music, but the accompanist made no sign. Evidently something was wrong. Mr. Kearney looked straight before him, stroking his beard, while Mrs. Kearney spoke into Kathleen's ear with subdued emphasis. From the hall came sounds of encouragement, clapping and stamping of feet. The first tenor and the baritone and Miss Healy stood together, waiting tranquilly, but Mr. Bell's nerves were greatly agitated because he was afraid the audience would think that he had come late. Mr. Hollihan and Mr. O'Madden Burke came into the room. In a moment, Mr. Hollihan perceived the hush. 
he went over to Mrs. Kearney and spoke with her earnestly. While they were speaking, the noise in the hall grew louder. Mr. Hollihan became very red and excited. He spoke volubly, but Mrs. Kearney said curtly at intervals, She won't go on. She must get her eight guineas. Mr. Hollihan pointed desperately toward the hall where the audience was clapping and stamping. He appealed to Mr. Kearney and to Kathleen, but Mr. Kearney continued to stroke his beard, and Kathleen looked down, moving the point of her new shoe. It was not her fault. Mrs. Kearney repeated, She won't go on without her money. After a swift struggle of tongues, Mr. Hollihan hobbled out in haste. The room was silent. When the strain of silence had become somewhat painful, Miss Healy said to the baritone, Have you seen Mrs. Pat Campbell this week? The baritone had not seen her, but had been told that she was very fine. The conversation went no further. The first tenor bent his head and began to count the links of the gold chain which extended across his waist, smiling and humming random notes to observe the effect on the frontal sinus. From time to time everyone glanced at Mrs. Kearney. The noise in the auditorium had risen to a clamor when Mr. Fitzpatrick burst into the room, followed by Mr. Hollihan, who was panting. The clapping and stamping in the hall were punctuated by whistling. Mr. Fitzpatrick held a few banknotes in his hand. He counted out four into Mrs. Kearney's hand and said she would get the other half at the interval. Mrs. Kearney said, This is four shillings short. But Kathleen gathered in her skirt and said, Now, Mr. Bell, to the first item, who was shaking like an aspen, the singer and the accompanist went out together. The noise in the hall died away. There was a pause of a few seconds, and then the piano was heard. The first part of the concert was very successful, except for Madame Glynn's item. The poor lady sang Killarney in a bodiless, gasping voice, with all the old-fashioned mannerisms of intonation and pronunciation which she believed lent elegance to her singing. She looked as if she had been resurrected from an old stage wardrobe, and the cheaper parts of the hall made fun of her high wailing notes. The first tenor and the contralto, however, brought down the house. Kathleen played a selection of Irish airs, which was generously applauded. The first part closed with a stirring patriotic recitation delivered by a young lady who arranged amateur theatricals. It was deservedly applauded, and when it was ended, the men went out for the interval content. All this time the dressing room was a hive of excitement. In one corner were Mr. Hollihan, Mr. Fitzpatrick, Miss Byrne, two of the stewards, the baritone, the bass, and Mr. O'Madden Burke. Mr. O'Madden Burke said it was the most scandalous exhibition he had ever witnessed. Miss Kathleen Kearney's musical career was ended in Dublin after that, he said. The baritone was asked what did he think of Mrs. Kearney's conduct. He did not like to say anything. He had been paid his money and wished to be at peace with men. However, he said, that Mrs. Kearney might have taken the artistes into consideration. The stewards and the secretaries debated hotly as to what should be done when the interval came. I agree with Miss Byrne, said Mr. O'Madden Burke. Pay her nothing. In another corner of the room were Mr. Kearney and her husband, Mr. Bell, Miss Healy, and the young lady who had to recite the patriotic piece. Mrs. Kearney said that the committee had treated her scandalously. She had spared neither trouble nor expense, and this was how she was repaid. They thought they only had a girl to deal with, and that therefore they could ride roughshod over her. But she would show them their mistake. They wouldn't have dared to have treated her like that if she had been a man. But she would see that her daughter got her rights. She wouldn't be fooled. If they didn't pay her to the last farthing, she would make Dublin ring. Of course she was sorry for the sake of the artistes. But what else could she do? She appealed to the second tenor, who said he thought she had not been well treated. Then she appealed to Miss Healy. Miss Healy wanted to join the other group, but she did not like to do so because she was a great friend of Kathleen's, and the Kearneys had often invited her to their house. As soon as the first part was ended, Mr. Fitzpatrick and Mr. Hollihan went over to Mrs. Kearney and told her that the other four guineas would be paid after the committee meeting on the following Tuesday, and that, in case her daughter did not play for the second part, the committee would consider the contract broken and would pay nothing. I haven't seen any committee, said Mrs. Kearney angrily. My daughter has her contract. She will get four pounds eight into her hand, or a foot she won't put on that platform. I'm surprised at you, Mrs. Kearney, said Mr. Hollihan. I never thought you would treat us this way. And what way did you treat me? asked Mrs. Kearney. Her face was inundated with an angry color, and she looked as if she would attack someone with her hands. 
I'm asking for my rights. You might have some sense of decency, said Mr. Hollihan. Might I indeed? And when I ask when my daughter is going to be paid, I can't get a civil answer. She tossed her head and assumed a haughty voice. You must speak to the secretary. It's not my business. I'm a great fellow, fall the diddle I do. I thought you were a lady, said Mr. Hollihan, walking away from her abruptly. After that, Mrs. Kearney's conduct was condemned on all hands. Everyone approved of what the committee had done. She stood at the door, haggard with rage, arguing with her husband and daughter, gesticulating with them. She waited until it was time for the second part to begin in the hope that the secretaries would approach her. But Miss Healy had kindly consented to play one or two accompaniments. Mrs. Kearney had to stand aside to allow the baritone and his accompanist to pass up to the platform. She stood still for an instant like an angry stone image, and when the first notes of the song struck her ear, she caught up her daughter's cloak and said to her husband, Get a cap. He went out at once. Mrs. Kearney wrapped the cloak round her daughter and followed him. As she passed through the doorway, she stopped and glared into Mr. Hollihan's face. I'm not done with you yet, she said. But I'm done with you, said Mr. Hollihan. Kathleen followed her mother meekly. Mr. Hollihan began to pace up and down the room in order to cool himself, for he felt his skin on fire. That's a nice lady, he said. Oh, she's a nice lady. You did the proper thing, Hollihan, said Mr. O'Madden Burke, poised upon his umbrella in approval. Thanks for listening to the Morning Short Podcast. I want to remind you to rate this episode five stars on iTunes and to visit share.morningshort.com to invite your family and friends to listen to stories from Morning Short. Learn more about the Morning Short Project and sign up for our daily emails at morningshort.com.